Hi, and welcome back to Publisher Nation, season two, episode three. So this is part of a 10 episode slate of shows that we're doing leading up to Digital Book World 2020, taking a look at each particular slice of the publishing landscape and how it's been affected, uh, not only by the pandemic, but just some of the trends that we expect to see coming out of it, heading into the second half of 2020 into 2021. Into 2021. My name is Bradley Metrock. I'm CEO of a company called Score Publishing based in Nashville, Tennessee. We are very pleased to have an excellent group of folks join us on the show today. Kelly Peterson, I'm going to start with you. Tell us who you are. Tell us who you're with. Tell us what you do. All right, um, and good morning to everybody. I'm, I'm in California, so I'm two hours behind most of the people on this call. Um, I am the Director of Digital Strategy at Independent Publishers Group, which is a distribution company that distributes uh, independent publishers solely. And I work also, I'm on a, the board of the Independent Book Publishers Association, so I spend a lot of time with indie publishers there as well. It's not just my job, it's my hobby. And the, one of the founders and board members of Bay Area Women in Publishing. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us. Next, our next guest is Trisha Gallagher. Trisha, tell us who you are. Tell us uh, who you're with. Tell us what you do. Sure. So um, I'm Trisha Gallagher, uh, as you mentioned, and for the past four and a half years, I've moved around Amazon's books team, learning the business so I can share it with authors. So in my current role, um, I am uh, primarily working with the author education team. So we work with uh, KDP University, which is a collection of all sorts of resources to help authors successfully publish on KDP. And KDP is Kindle Direct Publishing. It's the free self-service website that allows authors to publish both eBooks and paperback books. Um, and in 2007, Kindle Direct Publishing launched in the US only as a self-publishing site for eBooks. But in 2018, CreateSpace and KDP merged to become one site to publish both eBooks and paperbacks. Uh, today, we serve customers in 14 localized marketplaces and over 190 countries. But KDP is just one of several Amazon sites that help authors successfully reach their readers. So KDP works in tandem with other sites like Goodreads and Amazon Advertising, Amazon Author Central, and Audible Creation Exchange, or you may know them as ACX. And this helps authors reach new readers in multiple formats. Thank you very much for being part of the show. Absolutely. Happy to be here. Our next guest is Kinga Gentetics. Kinga, Kinga, say hello. And you're on mute. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Kinga Gentetics, CEO and co-founder of Publish Drive. Uh, and Publish Drive is the only easy to use software for indie publishers to distribute and manage ebooks, print, and audiobooks under one roof. I personally started uh, Publish Drive back in 2015 from Europe uh, with the need for a more transparent, simple usage and worldwide publishing for my own work. And since then, we have the mission uh, to help indies achieve publishing success in all parts of their publishing journey. Uh, with Publish Drive, we help on the distribution part to um, sell books all around the world um, at major retailers, but also to thousands of digital libraries and uh, subscription models as well. But we built a lot of other tools that can help indies succeed, like uh, a lot of promotional tools to boost sales. And also we have a cool AI uh, and deep learning robot called Savan that helps authors and also indie publishers uh, categorize their books and also um, target their ads better. Besides that, we started to help indie publishers on the royalty management side uh, with the tool we call Abacus, because we could see that uh, publishers were in need for a more transparent way of splitting royalties with their collaboration uh, projects. And that's 
why uh, we actually built Abacus, which helps you uh, transparently uh, split royalties with your collaborators. And that's all. And I'm happy to be here. We're happy to have you. Kinga, thank you very much for joining us on the show. Our fourth guest and our final guest, Tara Kremen of Rakuten Kobo. Tara, say hello. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank um, you very much for being here. Tell us who you are, who you're with, what you do. Sure thing. Um, my name is Tara Kremen and I'm the Senior Manager of Author Experience for Kobo Writing Life. Um, so Kobo Writing Life is Rakuten Kobo's self-publishing platform where we allow authors to publish their ebooks and audiobooks really easily um, onto Kobo's website and also onto our partner sites. So um, if you're not familiar with Kobo, um, we're literally all about books. Kobo is an anagram for the word book. <laughs> um, so even within the naming of itself, um, we have uh, retailers around the world we partner with, um, with, for instance, Walmart in the US where we are powering their eBooks and their audiobooks. So our focus really is on getting digital reading out there to everyone. And then my focus is on making um, the author experience the easiest it can be and um, helping authors reach a global audience. Thank you very much for being part of the show as well. Sure. All, all four of y'all are superstars. Appreciate you giving us uh, some, of, some of your time uh, just to share your expertise. So I'm going to start this conversation by saying that um, what has always intrigued me the most about publishing, period, is the fact that really for the first time in the history of mankind, the gatekeepers to publishing are mitigated, if not outright removed. And, you know, if you wanted to opine on whatever topic du jour you had in mind back in 1500, good luck with that. <laughs> if you wanted to, uh, to, if you wanted your voice to be heard, uh, back in the 18th century uh, by publishing a book. Uh, sorry, uh, you're born at the wrong time. We're so fortunate to live in a time where people have something to say. Guess what? For the most part on this planet, you get to say it. And the work that the four of you are doing within the realm of independent publishing helps make that happen. And I just think it's remarkable it's why we were attracted to digital book world so much and uh, why I was interested in having anything to do with this walk of life. I think it's remarkable. And so with that, you know, after that little soliloquy, I'd like to ask all four of you, and we'll reverse the order. I'm going to go through the order we just went through. And then as we go through the podcast, I'll reverse the order. But Kelly, I'm going to start with you. In your estimation, what is the state of independent publishing right now? How has the pandemic maybe shaped it or helped it or hurt it? But overall, what is the state of independent publishing today? Well, you know, that's a great question. And it really depends on the size of the independent publisher, I think. Um, for indie publishers who are small, and that includes author publishers who are publishing their own work, if they're doing if they were doing print on demand and ebooks, they're, they're probably pretty close to the same as they were before the pandemic ever hit. Um, print on demand has made it so that uh, people who are getting their books from a source like Ingram's POD program or Amazon's or IPG publishers who get it from both those places and our warehouse um, had no interruption in service. For people who are still doing offset print runs where there are larger independent publisher. They had a lot of inventory issues right at the beginning of the pandemic. Amazon stopped ordering and that caused a tremendous amount of uh, pressure on these littler publishers who had all their inventory tied up in warehouse stock. Um, but ebooks have been strong for everybody across the board and um, I would say our ebooks are, are trending up in double and triple digits depending on which month you're looking at. Excellent. So it sounds like a pretty good bill of health. Pretty good bill of health, although indie publishers do tend to run pretty close to margin all the time um, if they're printing Tory. I know a lot of small publishers that have had to uh, lay off staff, for example, during the pandemic because 
you know, things were moving on a digital front, but not necessarily moving forward with new books or books got delayed until later in the season. Interesting. Tricia, I'm going to ask you the same question. Your comments, your thoughts on the overall state of independent publishing. Well, um, I think that, you know, independent publishing, let's talk about, you brought up the fact that, you know, in certain aspects, uh, you're kind of out of luck if you wanted to publish. But um, I think, well, I think in that case, you actually had to create your own publishing house. But mm -hmm. with independent publishing, that's it's no longer, you know, it's been around for a long time. KDP has been around since 2007, and we've seen significant change over the last 13 years. Uh, most importantly, I think being an independent author now is just such an exciting time. You know, just like indie film or indie music, indie publishing is becoming mainstream. And, um, and it allows authors to pivot quickly, right? So if they can identify new um, genres, you know, things like lit RPG is, is a great example of a new genre that's come about when authors pivot and have that freedom and have that voice in order to focus on what their readers want, but also what they're interested in. And um, in addition to that, it really gives marginalized authors who may not have had a voice in traditional publishing that opportunity to have that voice now. And we're seeing that the writing with independent publishing is just top notch. It's really wonderful. Um, as far as you know, where we were you know, pre-COVID and where we are now, um, the, I think the biggest pivot that we've seen is more where with people spending more time at home, they have more opportunity to, to work on those goals or maybe those pipe dreams that they had. You know, that book that's been in the back office for forever that they've been working on, they now have that opportunity to um, pursue that. In addition to that, a lot of authors, you know, top authors, for example, KDP University at Home, we do interviews with authors and they're so willing to share their knowledge and um, be able to encourage new authors to, to now be part of that space. Um, I think it's just been a real sense, we're seeing just such a sense of community and support that's building up this space like we may never have saw before. Excellent. And just out of my own ignorance, what is Lit RPG? Oh, Literary RPG. It's a uh, role playing. It's based on its books. Let me see if I can get this right. It is books that are written uh, based on what you would see with role playing games. So there's that aspect. It's really fascinating and a lot of fun. Hmm. All right. Uh, so that's a big area of growth. That's what you said. Um, I think it's it, it's up and coming. I okay. think it's an it's a space that we haven't seen before. But th that's just one thing, you know. Paranormal women's romance, I think, is another uh, genre that's come onto the scene. But and it's exciting for um, to see in this case for that particular genre. What we're seeing is the heroines are in their forties, right, and dealing with. Things that, you know, instead of having a younger heroine uh, or hero, we're seeing women that are, you know, maybe not featured in some of the other, other books. I, I do love the fact that with independent publishing, whatever you're into, it can, it's, it's there. You know what I mean? And if it's not there, somehow you can create it. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. Yep. Kinga, same question for you. What, in your estimation, with what you've seen with Publish Drive, uh, is the current state of independent publishing? Yeah, so when we actually are working with independent publishers, uh, we always think about them as the new wave of publishers. So they are actually innovative and they think in different ways uh, and in new and innovative ways. And uh, one of them is like that, that they really work with their authors in a collaborative way. So they also draft their agreements, which are more flexible. And um, they also work with the authors pretty closely. Um, and what we also can see that they are really um, 
innovative when it comes to marketing and they are willing to try out new things as well. So uh, we love working with independent authors because they are really uh, open and, and flexible for all the other innovations that we are bringing to the table for them as well. And they really appreciate that. Um, and I think that's why indie publishers are getting more and more successful because they are more, in the, more uh, flexible, they are more transparent with their authors as well, and uh, they are more innovative when it comes to how they can reach their audiences. And uh, when it comes to what we've seen with Publish Drive, especially um, with the COVID-19, uh, we actually started to uh, put together a monthly book report, uh, which is based on Publish Drive sales data to see how books are performing during the whole um, COVID-19 uh, crisis. And we could see that books were selling well. So we, in both eBooks and also we started um, to sell audiobooks and print on demand just when the COVID-19 outbreak happened. So that was also um, a feature what most of the independent publishers we work with, uh, they really appreciated because that was a big help for them during this time. And also uh, we could see that um, a lot of authors and a lot of independent publishers were actually just rushing to publish Rhyme and they wanted to publish. And uh, yeah, that happened that some of the retailers were a bit slower because I'm sure that everyone else had that kind of um, experience that everyone wanted to publish right now because they could see that, okay, books are in demand right now. And um, when it comes to um, book sales, we could definitely see that some of the genres like romance were skyrocketing, uh, both in paranormal, but in fantasy as well, uh, fantasy kind of romance. Um, and also we could see that a lot of nonfiction books were selling pretty good. So we, we definitely could see that um, there was a lot of um, people who had to stay at home instead of traveling or, you know, traveling for work or for leisure, and they wanted to educate themselves. So uh, they actually turned to a lot of nonfiction books. So all the independent publishers who were into that area, they had a lot of boom in their book sales. And uh, we could actually see a 20% monthly growth rate uh, since March in our book sales um, for independent publishers. And that's still ongoing. So even though the world is still um, has a lot of problems with COVID-19, a lot of countries are actually opening up. So uh, we actually expected that there will be um, a decrease in the growth, but it's still there. So we believe that independent publishers will survive during this very unfortunate um, time. And, and we actually make every kind of innovation and development for them to make sure that it will happen. So we support them during the whole journey. Excellent. Yeah, that's another clean bill of health if I've ever heard one. Tara, I'm going to go to you. Um, same question. You know, uh, what are your comments? What are your thoughts on the state of independent publishing right now and maybe what the pandemic's done to it or not? But your thoughts. Sure. I think independent publishing is a really exciting industry to be in. Um, I really enjoy working in it. Um, and I believe that it's kind of being taken seriously. Like it's been around for quite some time. You know, people have been publishing their own books for, um, I think the digital wave is probably like 10 ish years old, if not more. Um, but I think now that um, people are starting to see that this isn't a trend with digital books, I think at the beginning that there was a lot of talk about how oh, this, you know, the traditional publishers would still have the kind of bulk of the sales and things, um, but that's not the case. So um, on Kobo, for example, in English language books, one in four books sold is independently published through Kobo Writing Life, which is huge. Um, so it's like a quarter of every book is just somebody that's like writing their own and publishing it themselves. Um, so it's really, really fast and moving really quickly. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting tremendously bugged by a fly. Um, so, but because Kobo has a, a global focus, um, when I think of independent publishing, I tend to break it up in my head with North America, which was kind of on the nose right at the beginning, um, and then European and rest of world kind of being um, a little slower to kind of um, delve into independent publishing with the same tenacity. 
Um, so what I've definitely started seeing um, from kind of as a result of the COVID-19 crisis is that there's far more people reading digitally in non-English geos. Um, we're seeing tremendous growth in Europe um, of areas that are kind of just just realizing the what the opportunities that independent uh, independent publishing has available. Um, and then North America is just way ahead with everything. The authors are so savvy. Um, as Kingu was saying, they're super innovative and um, they kind of are really open to experiment. So with this um, crisis, it wasn't, not that it didn't affect them, but I think that they're much easier to pivot. Like we had reports of traditional publishers having to move um, launch dates because, you know, they have to coincide it with a physical book and a lot of their sales being in stores. Whereas like our independent authors don't necessarily have that problem. Um, if they're churning out a book, you know, twice a year, twice a month, they're still able to do that on the same schedule. So um, yeah, I think it's really, really growing and people are starting to take it seriously. Did you say twice a month? Sometimes we had an author that published 33 books last year. So, you know, sometimes they can do it twice a month. <laughs> I know that's not necessarily twice a month. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good, good for them. Um, no, thank, thanks uh, to you. Thanks for all four of you, your comments on that. And uh, I want to sort of pick up with what you were saying, Tara, and, and uh, Kinga was saying it as well. And, and I, I, all, all four of y'all were sort of echoing the fact that independent authors, independent publishers um, are often more willing to take chances. Uh, they're more willing to experiment. They're willing to um, innovate. Uh, they're certainly more nimble and agile uh, because you're not dealing with the whole uh, enterprise. So uh, my question for you, Tara, and we're going to work backward uh, this time is uh, give me an example. It can be uh, within marketing, it can be within how the actual book is created, it can be any aspect of the, uh, the process of putting the book together all the way to promoting it. Give me the best example of, of an independent publisher that's applied technology to what they've done that you've seen can be this year, can be amidst the pandemic, or it can be before. Uh, hit, hit us with an example of an independent publisher using technology effectively. Sure. Um, I think just kind of like as a general um, COVID overview, like the thing that I noticed the most about the community embracing um, new technologies is the shifting of conferencing to moving online and that people aren't wanting to miss out on that interaction um, like that was previously mentioned. Um, they're a really generous community that are, you know, willing to share um, information they've had and like different success things. Um, so pivoting to online conferencing has been sort of great because you don't miss a conference because there's a time at the same thing, you know, like you can watch all of the talks that you want to. So that's been sort of exciting to see that happen. Um, and then in terms of like publishing itself, um, I think that just embracing different forms of book, you know, whether it's um, an audio book that you're also going to do with your ebook, um, or if you'd focus on like a translation. So we have some North American authors that are selling more in French than they are in English, just because of the huge reach that we have in France. Um, so that, I think that's been definitely um, something that they've been using technology to try and target the right areas for like what language will suit their books and like just researching genres and things like that. They're, they're ahead of, ahead of things. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, that, that's uh, several interesting things in there. Kinga, I'm going to ask you the same question. An example of um, successful application of technology to something an independent publisher has done that you've seen. Yeah, definitely when it comes to um, publishing, I think the speed of um, their publishing processes is totally different than at a big major publishing house. Because yeah, as Tara mentioned as well and other, others on this podcast also, yeah, there are authors who can publish 33 books per year. So they, they have to speed up their publishing process and they have to figure out a way how they can scale um, the usual way of uh, writing and also editing and also how they can outsource all of this kind of work. And so that's definitely, when it comes to production, they are super fast and, and they actually are using different um, softwares as well to speed up 
when it comes to translations, for instance, many of the indie publishers, they actually experiment with different AI and deep learning based uh, technologies to help on the translation part. Uh, and then of course, there is an editor who reads the book and also edits it. So it's not that, it's, because we are not at the time when machine translation would ever work, I think. Um, but they are experimenting with it. And, and there is more and more, um, you know, better translations coming to the picture. And there is always a human who is actually reading it and editing it. But at the end of the day, they have more translations of their book because they speed up the process be much faster and that's how they can actually explore more markets that's how they can figure out how where they should focus and i think uh, independent publishers they are really uh, tech savvy but also data savvy so whenever they have the chance to look for data or ask for data as well they do that and they dive into the data and they try to understand what's happening and how they can do better all the time so they, they never stop when it comes to innovating or, or uh, figuring out how to do things better. And I think that's their main strength. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for that. Tricia, same question for you. Um, an example of a successful application of technology to something that you've seen an independent publisher do. Yeah, I think I'm going to echo uh, what Tara was saying earlier is that we are seeing a lot of innovation around um, sharing of experiences through virtual um, space, you know, social media, the, the online conferences, a lot of conferences have moved online and they're, they're sharing that space. Um, and then they're taking their learnings, as, uh, as Kinga mentioned, they're, they're just so tech savvy, right? They're, they're into the analytics and the, the data. And then they're taking all of those learnings and using the, the new features that are being put out there at a great rate. You know, they, they just gobble it up. So um, we've been able to launch advertising in multiple languages. And the authors have been incredibly successful in using that um, as well as you know the new languages that we're able to offer support for like arabic hebrew yiddish and traditional chinese you know the 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 broader global um authors are being able to publish in all of those languages now and use that technology um, but I think another thing that uh, we've been able to do or that authors are taking advantage of, um, I want to focus on readers for just a second. So being able to innovate for readers as well. So things like making sure updates to Kindle Oasis or Kindle Paperweight uh, allows the readers to consume the content uh, quicker, and which in turn helps the authors um, by uh, increasing their earnings based on the sales and the consumption of the readers. Excellent. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, that's that's <clears throat> pretty interesting. I, I, I love the app, and Kinga was talking about it as well, just the application of different languages um, in different aspects of this. Um, Kelly, I'm going to ask you the same thing. A example of technology applied to something that you've seen an independent publisher do successfully. Well, I, I think that if there's one thing the pandemic taught us is that we can all do business from the comfort of our homes, right? So authors have been using um, all kinds of cross marketing to get the word out and have author events on Zoom and on Facebook Live. That's actually been a huge driver for our ebook and POD sales and, and even our regular print sales once uh, ordering resumed back to normal levels. So I would say that is a big piece um, that I don't want to to glide over and having missed a little bit of the conversation with technical issues, I wanted to make sure it was covered. But I think there's some really exciting things going on out there. Um, Bookshop.org is one of the things that has really flourished during the pandemic. Um, allowing bookstores to create stores that they can feature books. At, independent publishers have long been kind of shut out of bookstores um, as a whole. And bookshop.org is giving an opportunity for indie bookstores to support indie publishers in a new way. And I'm really excited about that um, because it doesn't mean 
um, an inventory trap where a lot of books come back and all of a sudden the publisher is again underwater. Uh, we don't ever want to see that and this is a great way for them to figure out what works well for their customers. Plus they get a 10% back revenue share from bookshop.org, which is a great organization really fueling and, and helping the publishing industry at a time of crisis. We're thrilled to have Andy Hunter, uh, founder of Bookshop, uh, be part of Digital Book World 2020 with us. And um, super interesting guy. And, yes. uh, you know, and we'll, uh, we'll get to see how, how long uh, it takes before Amazon uh, decides that they've uh, seen enough out of that and, and say, hey, come on, come on, join the fold. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but because uh, we've seen that before, but uh, yeah, it's it, competition's good for everybody, uh, and having someone uh, be able to to push the envelope uh, makes everybody better. Great examples uh, across the board. Um, I I'm intrigued by just going back to the language uh, discussion for a minute. Um, you know, one thing I've seen a little bit of so far with a company called StoryFit, if you're familiar with them, um, and there's a couple of other companies that are starting to delve into this is, and we see it more on, on the voice and conversational AI side, which we do a lot with, companies that are using um, different sort of machine learning processes to look at the text that you've created if you're an independent publisher, if you're a major publisher, it doesn't matter, and say, okay, uh, this writing here is generally across the board at a ninth grade level. Generally, it has an optimistic tone. Um, it's got this sort of character trope, and it's got uh, this amount of characters, or you know, 68% female, 32% male, and it does all this analysis and it says, okay, uh, we think that this book would be the be would be really well suited for this country, this country, this country, this country, this country, and uh, not as well suited for this one, this one, this one, this one. It, it's pretty interesting where technology is taking um, sort of agency oriented issues, um, and with independent publishers, you know, who represent themselves, a lot of times it's up to them to sort of uh, take advantage of that technology. But it's super interesting to me, and I, I say that just to preface uh, the final question here, um, and Kelly, I'm gonna start with you and, and work our way back uh, through our original order. Um, give me, uh, so July 1st, start of the second half of the year. So the first half of 2020 seemed like millennia, you know, eons long. Um, <laughs> the, the second half of the year is upon us. Um, Give, put on your Nostradamus hat and uh, pull out your crystal ball and give me one trend that you think we will see, independent publishers will see um, over the second half of 2020 into the start of 2021. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I would say that one of the things that independent publishing is really good at is providing space for different voices. So, you know, it, we need diverse books has been a hashtag at libraries for a long time. And I feel like I've been shouting, we have diverse books. Like we have all of these great publishers who publish that are, you know, uh, black owned publishers or are black indigenous people of color publishers. We have um, LGBT publishers. I just feel like they've all been there for a really long time producing really great content. And now this stuff is starting to surface up. And I think as people start to get past kind of the, you know, the new Jim Crow and, and white fragility, they're going to really start delving into this whole world of publishing that they haven't seen yet. But I think it's going to continue to be a diverse world in publishing. And the very, you know, the last month of publishing is going to carry us through all the way through till 2021, which is people reading people other than themselves. And I'm super excited about that. Like, I think that this is just opening a whole new world for readers all the way across the board, um, reading independent authors, reading independent publishers. Um, we have a, a, a group called Macro Publishing Group that's a collective of black women authors 
um, who released a series that just skyrocketed. Um, and they're now doing a second series and I'm already seeing pre-order after pre-order after pre-order every day when I come in. And I'm just super excited about it because it's really a new way of looking at what you read and what fiction is. And I, I can't wait to see how that develops over 2021. I love that. Yeah, and it just goes back to sort of what, what we were saying at the beginning of the episode, which is that if it weren't, if it weren't for independent publishing, you wouldn't have as many voices. And if you didn't have as many voices, then your ability to understand strife and conditions around the world would be diminished. So it's, uh, it is an exciting time. I echo that 100%. Trisha, I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, and with you, you know, I, I'm, I'm such a big fan of Alexa. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we know that team very well. Um, and I think in time, uh, Alexa will be seen as a very valuable tool for independent publishers. Um, I think that uh, Amazon deserves credit. I, I, on This Week in Voice, which is our, our main show uh, that we produce, I give Amazon a lot of credit because if it wasn't for their leadership, uh, we would not have voice and AI in the state that we have it today. And, uh, and so I think that um, there's interesting opportunities for like where you sit within Amazon and some of that stuff going on. But whether it involves that or something totally different, hit me with a trend that you think we're going to see um, play out over the second half of 2020 into the first part of 2021. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I would love to say that my omniscience tells me exactly where we're going, but that's never been the case for me. Otherwise, I would have won the lottery a while ago. But uh, what I can say is I'm going to um, go ahead and echo some of what Kelly said um, and then build from there. But I, I think that to, to Kelly's point, we're going to see that continuous demand for the traditionally marginalized uh, voices and um, hearing more and more and reading and, and engaging more as a community with um, just such a diverse author population. The content, as Kelly mentioned, the content's there. And now we're seeing people looking, actively looking for it and searching for it. Um, I think in addition to that, uh, with the, the change in dynamic as, as people are staying home, they're isolating or, um, you know, parents are looking for unique and innovative ways to educate their, their children at home. I think some of that's going to continue, um, you know, and in, in response to that, we're, you know, it's a great opportunity for people to publish, you know, puzzle books, coloring books, or, you know, activity books, as well as um, educational content, right? So I think that we're going to see that continue as well. Excellent. Yeah, great point. Homeschooling, um, not going anywhere. <laughs> and just reading about uh, some of Harvard's decision making yesterday, I'm not even going to go into that uh, separate podcast, separate time. Um, Thank you for that. Kinga, same question for you. Um, with what you do, your line of sight, what is a trend that you expect to see play out over the second half of 2020 into 2021? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so what we've seen so far, and I think it will continue to rise as well, that a lot of indie publishers are actually investing in multi-format publishing. So they are not just uh, publishing ebooks or print on demand, or uh, uh, but also audiobook um, audiobooks as well. So that's what we see that they are tremendously investing a lot of resources into creating more audiobooks. And also, when they have a new book, they actually or a new title, they actually publish them um, in different formats at the same time. And uh, that's definitely a trend where we see that will continue to rise, especially with the trend that a lot of uh, new readers appear who become listeners, basically, because they are not reading the physical or the ebook version, but they, listen, they are listening to the audiobook. And I believe this trend is ongoing already um, this year as well, but in the past year also, and it will continue to rise, especially with new 
um, retailers or new um, places opening up for audiobook distribution. Um, maybe you, you've seen that uh, on, Spotify, on Spotify, you could actually listen to um, the, a few chapters of Harry Potter as well as a podcast. So that was pretty cool to see, uh, especially during the COVID-19 that Spotify was opening up for audiobook uh, consumption uh, for the readers and listeners. And I believe this trend will continue and we will see a lot of new developments on this area. Excellent. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that um, we're already seeing some interesting convergence between audio, you know, because at the end of the day, what's the difference between a podcast and an audio book and a voice experience, you know, Alexa skill, Google action, you know, the lines are, lines are blurred and it has a lot of uh, implications for how publishers approach what they're doing. I think that's excellent. Tara, same question for you. Um, crystal ball out, Nostradamus hat on. What is the trend that you expect to see play out over the second half of 2020 into the first part of 2021? Well, I kind of just echo everything that's already been covered. I do have a magic eight ball up there, so I could have just like shook that for like some of the predictions. Um, but I do think, yes, the diversifying content that um, it's great that it's so readily available. And now that there's this renewed interest into um, people reading and listening to things like that. Um, and in terms of independent publishing, I do think kind of just having more formats available, like um, just making your book available to your readers, however they want to read it. Um, so with how what we are seeing at Kobo is that just really like a global focus, you know, you want to make sure that your books are available on multiple platforms, um, kind of making sure that they can be with all readers, um, especially with, I think there's kind of uncertainty at the moment, um, you know, are we heading toward an unfortunate recession that might affect people's kind of writing time or how they do their business. So I think just kind of thinking strategically about like making sure your eggs aren't in one basket, you know, I, I, I feel like we're seeing authors kind of doing more of this. And then also it's appealing to the readers at the same time. Well said, yeah. And I, if I were gonna add anything to, to any of that, I think it will be really interesting as well to see sort of dovetailing on the bookshop discussion, what the, over, what the eventual fate of Barnes and Noble is um, because however that plays out, uh, yeah, independent publishers had trouble getting in there, but um, how they modify their business um, will have a lot of repercussions for all the way down the chain to, to independent publishers and independent publishers continuing to figure out how to get their content out <clears throat> to as many people as possible, whatever medium it is, um, it'll be fun to watch. I appreciate all four of y'all. All four of y'all were awesome. Thank you for being part of Publisher Nation, taking the time to share your experience and your expertise with everyone. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. So with that, this is season two, episode three of Publisher Nation. Thank you for listening, watching, if you've been watching on YouTube. Until next time.